Morning. Today is Thursday, August 9th, 2018. You're watching the Daily Mix TV by Hill Story Marketing. Hi, my name is Sean Patrick Hillman. Wow, that was fast. Albertsons and Rite Aid last night announced they've mutually decided to terminate the proposed merger of their companies. Termination comes a day before Rite Aid was set to hold a special shareholders meeting at which the company has been urging its shareholders to vote in favor of the merger. Now, Certain Rite Aid shareholders and a third-party advisory firm had come out publicly against it. Even though they had acknowledged there was a strategic logic to the merger, they just felt that Albertsons, quite frankly, was not offering sufficient merger consideration to Rite Aid shareholders. Albertson said that in consulting with its board, it was just unwilling to change the terms of the merger. As such, Rite Aid CEO John Stanley said that despite believing in the merits of the merger, they had listened to their shareholders and have committed to moving forward as a standalone company. You know, guys, not all mergers are created equally, and clearly some fall apart before they happen. As an example, moments ago, breaking news hit that uh, Sinclair and Tribune will not, or Sinclair will not be acquiring Tribune Broadcasting. As a matter of fact, Tribune is suing Sinclair. We'll get into that on tomorrow's issue of the Daily Mix TV. Remember when cable TV station TNT's tagline was, we know drama? Well, it seems like Papa John's may know it better. A pizza chain same store sales in North America dropped 10.5% in July. That's a significant dump year over year. The decline has put the chain's founder, John Schnatter, and its new CEO at odds, with both blaming the other for lagging sales. The company issued a statement that they can't predict how long and the extent to which the negative customer sentiment will continue to impact future sales. For his part, Schnatter came out fighting, saying, you know what, you're trying to deflect attention from the source of the problem, and that would be current management. Honestly, guys, I've seen more maturity in a schoolyard fight at 3 o'clock in the afternoon between third graders. These people really need to settle this now and out of the public eye, getting back to business or their employees and shareholders will suffer even more. Now, it's about time someone held Uber and Lyft accountable for exactly how much they've screwed up the streets of New York City. Both companies were dealt a major blow last night by the New York City Council when it passed a package of regulations targeting ride-hailing apps. The bills capped the number of ride-hailing vehicles on city streets, halting the issuing of licenses for the services and allows the city to set a minimum pay for drivers. New York is the first major city to implement such rules for ride-hailing companies. Now, Uber and Lyft spent an abnormal amount of money, I mean, we're talking a lot of cash, to try and defeat these bills, including trying to mobilize their riders to oppose the proposal. Now, what I find so incredibly unbelievable about this is the arrogance and the dishonesty of both New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio and New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo. They've both proposed some type of congestion toll or tax in Manhattan. Well, the reality is Mayor Bloomberg, during his tenure, destroyed Manhattan's traffic flow by eliminating a third of our vehicular lanes for bike lanes and pedestrian parks. Then in 2015, when Uber only had 25,000 cars on the road, de Blasio failed to get then City Council Speaker Melissa Mark Viverito to vote for a cap on Uber. Well, now they're at over 100,000 cars. Now, here's where the dishonesty and talking out of both sides of their mouth comes in. Uh, the Speaker of the City Council, Corey Johnson, announced last month that they were going to put forth a proposal to put a, a cap on these cars. And Bill de Blasio publicly stated, I'm not sure I can support the cap. Are you kidding me? Seriously? Traffic is at an all-time high in New York, and we've got a politician who's playing both sides of the fence. It's not right, and it's disgraceful. We need to stop electing people who talk out of both sides of their mouths to pander for votes while screwing the very people who elect them. We need to get back to common sense laws and policies that are going to promote business, promote tourism, and frankly, stop the nonsense and the filth that is taking over New York as I speak. Chicago City newspaper publisher Tronk is considering selling itself to a private equity firm. It's a story that came out in the Chicago Tribune yesterday. 
The firm, which owns the Trib, as well as the New York Daily News and the Orlando Sentinel, amongst a slew of other papers, is considering a bid of $19 to $20 a share for a potential total of $700 million. Now, as we all know, in recent months, Tronk has been cutting costs and selling off assets. In June, the firm sold the LA Times and the San Diego Union Tribune to biotech entrepreneur Patrick Shung Xian for $500 million. Excuse me, it's Patrick Sun Xiong for $500 million. And just last month, Tronk eviscerated most of the Daily News staff. To be honest with you, I really wouldn't be surprised if Tronk files for bankruptcy in the very near future. For our Throwback Thursday segment this week, 32 years ago yesterday, one of the greatest coming-of-age stories in history hit the silver screen. In all our lives, there's a fall from innocence, a time after which we are never the same. It happened in the summer of 1959, a long time ago. Oh, man, where do you hear this? Where do you hear this? What is it, man? You guys want to go see a dead body? When the night has come and the land is dark. We interrupt to bring you an update on the search for the missing 12-year-old Ray Brower. Kid's gone. They're never going to find him. Not where they're looking. And the moon is the only We'll see. You think Mighty Mouse could beat up Superman? Mighty Mouse is a cartoon. Superman is a real guy. No way a cartoon could beat up a real guy. We're going to be famous. We're going to be on every radio and TV show in the country. I still don't think we should go. <laughs> I can only have one food for the rest of my life. That's easy. Pass. Cherry flavor pass. No question about it. I like to go someplace where nobody knows me. We found him. We got dibs. Oh, we better start running, eyeball. They got dibs. <laughs> There's four of us, eyeball. We just make you move. You're dead. For some. It's the last real taste of innocence. I'm never going to get out of this town now, my glory. You can do anything you want, man. And the first real taste of life. This is really a good time. The most a blast. But for everyone, it's the time that memories are made of. So darling, darling, stand by me. Oh, stand by me. Starring a young rabble of River Phoenix, Jerry O'Connell, Corey Feldman, Will Wheaton, and the more established Richard Dreyfus and Kiefer Sutherland, Stand By Me inspired a generation of kids to be independent and to strive to better ourselves. Sadly, on a personal note, less than a decade later, I had met River Phoenix and we had become friends, hanging out many nights in New York and L.A. And I mean, cursory friends, not, not real, real close. On the fateful night at the Viper Room on L.A. Sunset Strip when he died of an overdose, I was there. He was a very nice man, very talented actor, and I do miss him. He was a good guy. Now, also on this day, iconic legend Whitney Houston would have turned 55 years old. Houston died on February 11th of 2012 of coronary artery disease and cocaine use. My name is Sean Patrick Hillman. I'm the CEO of Hill Story Marketing. I'm also the editor-in-chief of The Daily Mix TV. Thanks for watching, folks. We'll see you tomorrow.